Well, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here in front of a, an immense audience. Uh, this is very exciting for us. And again, I welcome you on behalf of all of the steering committee. Um, I was fortunate to act as Greg Randolph's co-chair as we organized this meeting. The truth of the matter is the best person to co-chair with is Greg Randolph, because everything that needed to be done, he did. And I only stand here to take some of the credit, but I had to do almost none of the work. So it's a wonderful ex example of teamwork. <laughs> um, the team that I'm going to introduce today is a very exciting team as well, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming along here and withstanding my assault on you this morning. Um, I really want to make sure that we challenge some of the assumptions we all make in management of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, and so we're going to have some very simple cases that probably represent some of the most challenging decisions we ever have to make in the field of thyroid nodules. So introducing people from the... Uh, uh, far right, Dr. Um, uh, Hodak, Dr. Steve Hodak is from the Langone Medical Center in New York City. Um, he is an endocrinologist by training and an expert in both thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a surgeon uh, who hails from the University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio, and is an expert, of course, in thyroid surgery. Uh, next to him is um, Dr. Susan Mandel from the University of Pennsylvania in, in Philadelphia, an endocrinologist and an expert in imaging of the thyroid gland, who really helped to write, in fact, I think single-handedly wrote the section on thyroid nodules in the most recent iteration of the American Thyroid Association guidelines. Next is Dr. Eric Alexander from Brigham and Women's here in Boston, an endocrinologist and an expert in the application of molecular marker technology to indeterminate cytology in thyroid nodules, and uh, the first author on one of the most seminal papers in that field published in the New England Journal a few years ago. So again, a great pleasure to have Eric with us today. And then last but not least, a household name, Dr. Yuri Nikiforov, um, who has worked for many years around the molecular genetics of thyroid cancer and thyroid nodules, and who is the developer and primary investigator of the thyroseq assay, which is another molecular assay used in the uh, evaluation of indeterminate <coughs> thyroid nodules. And Yuri is by training a pathologist and hails from Russia, and I think is the only um, international member of this team up here, but at least we have one international <laughs> member for the International or Congress. Um, I guess I count as well, because I'm from Scotland originally, so I'm also international. But I work in Tampa, Florida, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in the Northeast here in Boston. So hopefully we can make these uh, slides work. So I just wanted to set the stage, if I can, a little, uh, around thyroid nodules. And thyroid nodules, as everybody in this room knows, are incredibly common. And the harder that you look, the more you're going to find them. This is a typical example of a young woman, 36 years old, presenting with an absolutely asymptomatic lump in the front of her <coughs> neck, which is, of course, a thyroid nodule. And by palpation alone, we can find nodules in up to 10% of individuals beyond the age of about 60 to 65 years old. Women more often than men, but nonetheless, nodules incredibly common. When we look with ultrasound technology, and these data date from 1993, when Ernie Matsaferi published them in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, the rate of thyroid nodules is incredibly high. In fact, 50% of adult women have a thyroid nodule, and more than 50% of all adults have a thyroid nodule beyond the age of about 65 or 70. So it actually becomes normal to have a thyroid nodule and abnormal to not have a thyroid nodule once you're over the age of about 60. And that's an incredible reservoir of non-disease in our communities, which if we discover all those, investigate all those, and treat all of those, is going to bankrupt our healthcare systems the world over. And so one of the key challenges in the evaluation of thyroid nodules, in my opinion, is separating the needle from the haystack, identifying the small number of important cancers within this ocean of benign nodular thyroid disease. And we're hoping to tap into that today. Of course, the flip side of the coin is that thyroid cancer is also increasing in incidence more rapidly than any other cancer type. Projections suggest that in the United States, uh, thyroid cancer will be the highest incident thyroid cancer by 2035 and will be the highest prevalent thyroid uh, type of cancer, because most of our patients live forever, the highest prevalent within the next decade. 
So I'm thinking about changing the name of my institution from Moffat Cancer Centre to Moffat Thyroid Cancer Centre because it will become the dominant issue we deal with. Part of the reason for that increase, we believe, is related to the increasing number of fine needle biopsies that we are performing and our colleagues are performing. Give an endocrinologist an ultrasound and a needle and there's a temptation to do a biopsy. And the number of fine needle aspiration procedures in the United States each year is rising exponentially as shown in the right curve. And I think it's no coincidence that the number of cases of thyroid cancer <laughs> correlates with the number of FNA procedures. And the question is how much of that is meaningful, worthwhile, therapeutic intent for patients and how much of it is just nothing other than us spinning our wheels and identifying non-threatening disease. The American Thyroid Association has uh, done a good job, I think, over now three iterations of the guidelines to develop recommendations for how to evaluate a thyroid nodule. And the flow sheet that I've shown on this slide is pretty simple and straightforward. It really highlights two major component parts. Number one, that thyroid ultrasonography is key to the evaluation of thyroid nodules. And essentially, we should no longer be evaluating nodules without the use of ultrasound. And secondly, that cytology using some kind of standardized approach in the United States, that's the Bethesda classification, is really key to understanding the risk of malignancy that we are facing with a thyroid nodule. And of course, doing a biopsy is simple and straightforward. Many of us in this room do this on a daily basis, identifying the nodule with the ultrasound, using some kind of an injector or, or an aspiration technique to withdraw cells from the ultrasound, spread them on the slide. And it's remarkable within just a few tries, you can get really, really good at getting needles into tiny, tiny nodules. So my um, uh, colleagues have uh, sometimes been biopsying nodules as small as three or four millimeters. You have to ask the question, why? Uh, but we do it, and it's easy, and it's fun, and we like it, and it makes us money in the United States as well, so it's very, very tempting to do it, and avoiding the temptation is key. And so how do we avoid the temptation? Well, the American Thyroid Association says avoid the temptation by being very strict about the criteria by which you choose a nodule to biopsy. And this somewhat complex diagram is published as part of the ATA guidelines, and I'd like to suggest that uh, Dr. Mandel is probably single-handedly responsible for generating this. So Susan, would you be willing just to justify your thought process, both around the uh, grouping of these nodules into these different categories, and also the decision to um, biopsy at specific size thresholds? So I, I think the general concept when we're evaluating thyroid nodules is to try to identify cancers and potential cancers that have clinical relevance. And there are sonographic correlates with that. And although you haven't asked me to comment this, I, I do want to say historically, this was actually formulated almost two and a half years ago in 2015. So that what we looked at were what was then validated in the literature as patterns that were associated potentially with highest risk for cancer, as well as cancers that were potentially those for which there could be clinical relevance if they remained in someone's neck. And those became the five patterns that are shown in the first row, the high suspicion pattern. And remember, this was also prior to the definition of NIFT-P, although I would argue that the um, six patterns, excuse me, in the first row, none of those would probably be consistent with the NIFT-P. Um, and so at the time that we wrote this, we looked at patterns that were most likely to be correlated, hi the highest specificity for malignancy, potentially more virulent malignancies, and those ended up in the high suspicion pattern with the lowest cutoff for biopsy of one centimeter that could be potentially modified a little bit today. We then went down because there are other patterns, and you can see we've subsequently divided them into intermediate suspicion. I suspect you can't read the numbers, which are 10 to 20 percent, low suspicion, 5 to 10 percent, very low suspicion, and benign. And so what I'd like to then do is often when you're defining something, you define what is cancer, what isn't cancer, and then you deal with what's in the middle because the data are usually best for what is and what is not. So clearly we knew that cysts were benign. And we also knew that spongiform nodules had a very, very low risk. And although it does say the cutoff is two centimeters, the option is to observe. So that it is not compulsory to biopsy a spongiform nodule at two centimeters. It's suggested that if you were to opt to do that in your practice, at least let the cutoff be two centimeters. But the other option is to observe, which is what I do in my practice, where I do not aspirate spongiform nodules. So two centimeters are observation. 
Um, the issue is with the nodules that fall into the patterns of low suspicion and intermediate suspicion, which is always the most challenging. And also, again, probably like cytology, the least robust for some of the inter-observer features when you're trying to identify patterns, and the most with nuances. So we did our best job to recognize that isoechoic nodules were associated with a different malignancy risk than hypoechoic nodules, and I suspect the NIFT-P will decrease the malignancy risk associated with isoechoic nodules, and I suspect if we had to remodify that now, we'd probably push that threshold up a little bit higher. And so those were our general thought processes based on the data that we had then. Eric was also part of that group. I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, anything else to add to add the anything. discussion? No, I think you described it um, exquisitely, and I think the concept is, if anything in this field, and that wouldn't include just thyroid nodules, but thyroid cancers, that we're moving as a field to be more conservative, and this is a major step in that direction, to utilize the power of ultrasound and sonographic features, which are actually very good, although not perfect, uh, to allow us to be a little bit more conservative in how we approach patients, as opposed to a, a standard one centimeter cutoff. And just, I'm going to just add one thing, and many of you have asked or have seen, and there are probably many radiologists in the room, the ACR tyrads. Um, which is much more of a point accounting system. And I think, I think all of our patterns, whether you're talking about the ACE patterns, whether you're talking about the European patterns or the British pattern, patterns, are all very good at what is and what is not cancer, and they all struggle with how to deal with what's in between. And there are some minor differences there as well, um, but I think the actual system that you use operationally depends upon where you come from. And for those of you who work with radiologists, they're very used to a point system because that's how they do BIRADS. So this idea of assigning points to features and then doing a sum is very familiar to them, whereas probably more to endocrinologists and surgeons who've come at this as a pattern recognition, this type of system of looking at images which combine numbers of features together will probably resonate more with us. So I think that there'll probably be a number of ways to approach nodules for very much with Eric's idea that the idea is that we, we want to cut back, we want to identify what we need to and leave alone what we don't need to. So you've alluded to it a little bit already, and, and thank you for a very thorough discussion of that, but you've alluded to the fact that the very low risk category has a very low risk of malignancy. In fact, the number is quoted as less than 3%, as I recall. Um, with that level of uh, risk of malignancy, it's about the same as it is for a benign cytopathology result. So the question is, why biopsy those ones at all? Should this uh, guideline actually be to not biopsy uh, spongiform nodules? So the guideline at this point offers both options, as it was written, as that was put together about two and a half years ago. So you may clearly opt not to biopsy a spongiform nodule, which is what we do in our practice. And that's one of the things that probably now we're two and a half years later, and it's something sometimes will be revised, that I suspect that that will go towards a stronger recommendation to not biopsy a spongiform nodule at all. And at the other end of the extreme, let me pull um, Dave uh, um, into this discussion as well. Dave, your thoughts around the high risk of suspicion, those patterns with <coughs> microcalcifications and uh, irregular borders, you already know that's a papillary thyroid cancer. Do you really need a biopsy to prove that before you're going to operate on somebody? Oh, I don't think you have to, um, but I do think that it helps inform um, your decision making a little bit. It, it certainly, um, it's easier, I think, for the patient to um, digest that if you, if you do biopsy it. Um, if the question is, if it looked like that and the biopsy came back benign, would I still take it out? The answer is probably yes, but um, if I do confirm the suspicion uh, clinically that I have, then I feel like, you know, when the patient comes back to go over the biopsy, they've had a little bit of time to think about it. I've already told them that I think this is probably going to need to come out. Certainly with the, um, the issue of the lateral uh, neck node, um, in general, we like to biopsy those before performing a, a, a lateral neck dissection to confirm um, that that's indeed necessary, especially with sort of a one centimeter node. You know, a three centimeter node, you know, maybe you just take it out anyway. Um, but so I think it. I think it's worthwhile. I think the patients um, uh, benefit from that. Steve, you want to add a yeah, comment? Yeah, if I could just amplify on one of David's points, which I think is really on the money. Um, when I see a nodule like that, what that means to me is that you must do an exhaustive uh, inventory of the lateral uh, neck. And I think too often radiologists don't make that connection. Even many endocrinologists don't do that. And I've seen many patients go for 
inadequate surgery because they have lateral neck disease or deep central compartment disease that you can see with an ultrasound that's missed only because it wasn't looked for. I think, to me, that's a really critical point. Um, since I moved from Minnesota to Florida, I discovered that uh, radiologists in the state of Florida actually distinguish a thyroid ultrasound, which is focused <laughs> exclusively in that central part of the neck and the structure of the thyroid gland, from a neck ultrasound, which is the soft tissues to include the Let's lymphoma. just say those radiologists in Florida probably worked somewhere else before they went to Florida. <laughs> so we see them too. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was very different from my experience in the upper Midwest, but it's something for sure we need to watch out for. When you ask for a, a neck ultrasound, sometimes you don't actually get the thyroid information. When you ask for a thyroid ultrasound, you often don't get the neck information. And in surgical planning terms, that's a critical understanding, I think, uh, uh, to make. So let me just uh, move on to the next slide here, because this is um, how we then should be assessing our fine needle aspiration biopsy if we do it, and that's using this Bethesda classification system. And um, Steve, I was hoping that you would uh, help to uh, walk us through this Bethesda classification for us and, and understand how you use it surgically. Because what we've got here is a range of malignancy in these different classes from uh, essentially uh, it, well, at the low end, 1 to 4 percent risk of malignancy, all the way up to 99 percent risk of malignancy. But there's a bunch of things in the middle. Right. And in the era before Eric and Yuri developed any molecular markers, or in parts of the world where molecular markers are not available, how do you handle those intermediate classes? Um, right. So I think the way all of the endocrinologists use the Bethesda system uh, surgically is that as soon as we feel there's a surgical indication, we refer the patient to one of our very competent surgical colleagues like David to take care of these people. Um, but I think the Bethesda system was um, a, an attempt to standardize the, the way we refer to various patterns of cytopathology. Um, it was successful in, in the sense that it's very, um, I think, fairly simple, it's fairly straightforward, it's been very widely um, adopted. I think the difficulty with the Bethesda system is that not everything that's called an apple is, an, is the same apple in everyone's eye. What do I mean by that? Um, if you look at the prevalence of malignancy in the various Bethesda categories, um, they're highly variable uh, from institution to institution, and there's a huge amount of not only inter-observer variability, but there is intra-observer variability as well. So Ed Seba's paper from 2013, which is excellent that a number of people in the audience um, uh, were authors on, was, was very interesting. There was one observation that when uh, cytopathologists who are experts in the field read their own cytopathology case 30 days apart from the initial reading, they disagree with their own reading 25% of the time. So that tells us something about the limits of light microscopy. And I think that as a field, we've probably pushed light microscopy about as far as we can. So we have a system like Bethesda, which attempts to classify things as inadequate. There's not usually a lot of disagreement about what that means. Surprisingly, even when a pathologist calls something malignant, that's not something that everyone can always agree on. So too for benign. And then the three categories in, in the middle, the AUS, FLUS, Bethesda 3, Bethesda 4, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for malignant cells, Bethesda 5, there's a lot of variability about what actually constitutes the right diagnosis in that category. So, I think this, we'll get into the molecular diagnostic discussion, but I think that's really the reason that molecular diagnostics have arisen. And I think that's the main um, and key value of molecular diagnostics now, along with prognostics, which um, speak to eventual outcomes of thyroid cancer patients. But I, and if that is an adequate answer, I think that's how I and I think everyone else is using Bethesda. So, so I have one just corollary question. Why is it that the risk of malignancy in uh, AUS plus is reported to be anywhere from 6% to 48%? That does seem to be a rather broad uh, risk of malignancy range and very difficult to know what to do with those patients. Right. So, th so the problem is, is that if you have a specimen where there is atypia that you don't feel is adequate to qualify it as either malignant or suspicious, and you have a, a, a concept of what constitutes a Bethesda 4 diagnosis of follicular neoplasm, you need a place to put that diagnosis. So there's a wide, wide variance in what winds up in a category like uh, Bethesda 3. And in fact, when you look at the data, that's the category where there's the greatest disparity in, in uh, cancer prevalence and, and the greatest variability in what those aspirates actually look like. 
Yeah, so it becomes a bit of a, of a garbage pail for everything that doesn't fit into one other category. Right. Um, is that uh, common amongst pathologists, Yuri, that we uh, create categories that don't mean anything? <laughs> well, uh, be, being, being a pathologist by myself, I, I have to kind of a little bit defend at least, the, you know, pathologist because it sounds like, you know. You know you're outnumbered, right? <laughs> I know that I'm outnumbered. Um, look, the truth of the matter is that cytology is a screening is a screening procedure, and this is important to keep in mind. And, some, and, and the specimens, they also vary from being very sort of cellular, very adequate, to really very minimal, with very few groups of cells. So, I mean, this is something that you give to us, the pathologists, you know, to evaluate. And, and pathologists are not magicians, you see. They, they rely on, they rely on a, they need a number of cells, a number of follicles, and, 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 and certain cellularity to really arrive to the diagnosis. And there are some smears, where you show it to five cytologists and they give you exactly the same diagnosis. There are some smears where they give you five different diagnoses. This is, this is, that's, that's the reality of life. But I want to also sort of, you know, stress the point that Dr. Hodak mentioned, that look, every method has its own resolution. And the cytologist, we look at the, we look at the nuclear features, and now with NIFT-P, it becomes even a little bit less clear. We look at proportion of, I mean, architecture, microfollicles present or not, and we look at the ratio of cells to colloid. And if you think about it, this is really, there is only certain limit where you can push this, this examination. And above that limit, does it matter how good you are, there will be intrinsic variability in the interpretation and uncertainty in the diagnosis. So it sounds a lot like the ultrasound picture that we were discussing before, that at the two extremes it's relatively easy, but in the middle we've got a big gray area of uncertainty. Is that a fair that's, analysis of the situation? Yeah. And Brian, you, know, you asked us to be provocative on Please. this panel, and yeah. I think everybody's being very um, adult and grown up so far, so let me hurl the first stone. Uh, <laughs> I think that's exactly the right point, that cytology is a lot like ultrasonography. We're very good on the extremes, what is obviously bad and what is obviously good, and we struggle with what's in the middle. So maybe it's time that we start pushing cytology more in that direction, where we realize that what we can do with cytology is, is often say with very good confidence that something is clearly bad and requires surgical management or clearly good and probably would be best dealt with with observation and figure out other ways of dealing with these things in the middle without trying to stuff them into a category. And I do think that's where the molecular diagnostics is going to be key, whichever test you happen to prefer um, or believe in. Any other comments from the panel about that concept of just eliminating Bethesda 3, 4, and 5 altogether and just having a rag bag in the middle? Eric. I guess I, I wouldn't support throwing all the work that's gone into Bethesda yet yet away. I do understand exactly what Steve's getting at, and I um, and I totally appreciate the, the angle where it's going. You know, I think I just I, I think I just put my support behind um, Susan laid out perfectly how the advancements in categorizing sonographic features has allowed us to speak a, now a common language and given us kind of a risk assessment and guidance, but it's not perfect. Steve spelled out perfectly that Bethesda has allowed us to speak the same language, has clearly given us guidance, but is definitely not perfect. And at the end of the day, the guidelines will also clarify that you should individualize care for everyone. And I think that's the perfect starting point for both uh, how to approach a nodule, but also then how to understand the downstream effect of what the surgeons do and how molecular diagnostics are used, et cetera. And, and just something to add, we talked about ultrasound making the decision for FNA, and then once it's done, we almost put ultrasound aside, and then we take the information from cytology, and we will be talking about molecular tests, but I think we have to go towards more of an integration, so that if we have a Bethesda 3 or a Bethesda 4, before we even get to molecular testing, there's a growing literature that once you have Bethesda 3, the risk of malignancy in that nodule may depend upon what the sonographic appearance looked like. So in other words, reintegrating all of the information rather than saying, we made our discrete decision to biopsy a nodule based on ultrasound, and now we're going to forget the ultrasound appearance and just do decision making on cytology, but putting everything back together. And I think that will also help lead us forward. So the clinical history, the physical exam, the ultrasound, and the cytology, and if you're going to use them, the molecular markers, integrate that as a whole and then make your decision about the patient. And I, you know, again, I, I couldn't endorse that view any more strongly. And I, and I would include the, the patient input, 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 of yes, course, into that preference. as well. Very good point. Very good point. So here's the nodule challenge in a nutshell. Um, we uh, 
find a thyroid nodule, according to ATA guidelines, we should um, not check and <coughs> biopsy if the TSH is suppressed. Hmm. Why is that? David, why would you okay. not want me to biopsy a nodule when the TSH is suppressed? You've got these endocrinologists and you're asking the surgeon. Yep. <laughs> um, I think that it makes sense in the unusual situation of a single solitary nodule um, and the patient has what appears to be hyperthyroidism because it does seem that the risk of malignancy in that setting is, is lower. Um, whether you do imaging with radioiodine or not, you know, I, that's not really my area of, of expertise. But as soon as it becomes a multinodular goiter, I tend to rely on the sonographic features to determine the need for malignancy rather than, or the, the need for the biopsy rather than the, the TSH. Um, I, I think that there's good data that says hypothyroidism has a higher risk of, you know, at least clinically relevant malignancy than hyperthyroidism, but you can certainly have malignancy within that presence. So um, I'm not so convinced that that's a problem. In the worst case scenario, I tell my residents, and, you know, forgive me for this, but if you did make the mistake of sticking a toxic adenoma and it came back as a possible follicular neoplasm and you did a lobectomy, you would probably have cured the patient of their <laughs> hyperthyroidism. So it's not the end of the world, but on your board exam, certainly tell them you do otherwise. Yeah. Um, Steve, your thoughts on that as an endocrinology perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think like so much of what we do, you know, we have recommendations like this and, and they're really recommendations and they become dogma in, in many people's mind. I mean, there, there are cases of hyperfunctioning malignant nodules, right? And these, these have the same um, overtly suspicious radiographic, ultrasonographic characteristics as other malignant nodules. So to say that you shouldn't stick a needle in a toxic nodule, a hyperfunctioning nodule, or in a nodule in a patient with a suppressed TSH is probably right most of the time, except for when it's not. And it's the except for when it's not that you don't want to miss. So you have to, again, do exactly what you talked about a minute ago consider the entire clinical picture. What does the nodule look like? What's the clinical history? What are the risk factors? So if this is somebody that lived in Chernobyl when she was 12 years old and was, you know, sitting on the nuclear reactor when it melted down, and she has an ugly looking nodule, and she happens to have a suppressed TSH, I'm going to ignore that TSH and do a fine needle aspiration of that nodule. So if and you do a fine needle aspiration, Yuri, what are you going to see under the microscope? That was my point. But by, by sticking needle, you have to accept the reality that almost always it will come as indeterminate. It will never come back as benign because features of cell hyperfunctioning, in a way, they overlap with the atypia that we see in tumors. So there is, you have to be prepared to get the at least indeterminate diagnosis in this case. Right. And then so I'm going to send a specimen to Yuri in Pittsburgh, or we'll send a specimen to... <laughs> a uh, verisite for analysis, and we'll see what the molecular diagnostics tell us. So um, we were always taught in fellowship that uh, the reason to not biopsy a thyroid nodule that is hot is because they're always benign. In reality, the reason we don't biopsy nodules that are hot is because of the point you were making, Yuri, that you're going to get an indeterminate cytology. It really has little to do with the risk of malignancy. It's got everything to do with being able to interpret the cellular material you withdraw. Um, in the era of molecular markers, maybe indeed this is going to change as a, as a recommendation. Uh, but still right now the ATA says at least evaluate for a hot nodule if you're facing a TSH suppression. So we do a biopsy, it's benign. We all agree, I think, that clinical follow-up's appropriate instead of surgery, so long as that nodule is asymptomatic and reasonably small. Is there a size limit that you'd be willing to uh, you know, uh, set as a threshold? that you should always remove even a cytologically benign thyroid nodule? And again, David, I'm going to turn to you from a surgical perspective. <laughs> I assume that was um, coming my way. Um, I think that if the um, biopsy was done with ultrasound guidance, the sample error false negative rate concern is so low that I don't think you take out what is a sonographically benign appearing large nodule because of concern for malignancy. But, but let me challenge you because um, there's publications in the literature that say you should not trust a biopsy in a nodule greater than four centimeters. Some people say three and a half. And I think that most of those are palpation guided biopsies and I think that's where the real problem is. If you have a four centimeter nodule and you feel like you can put a needle in it, 
and you get a, a positive result, you can probably believe it. But if you get a benign result, I don't think you can. I think the false negative rate is 10 to 15 percent with palpation guided versus roughly 3 percent uh, with um, ultrasound guided FNA. Um, having said that, I do think that based on the patient's age, symptoms, et cetera, somewhere in the four centimeter size range, we start thinking about taking them out because they're already big, they're likely to keep growing, you're only 35, are we really going to watch this forever? Whereas if somebody's 75 and had a four centimeter nodule that's spongiform and cytologically benign, I mean, we just reassured them that we don't need to do anything, probably doesn't need anything more done. So let me turn then to the other side of the equation, the malignant ones. It comes back as a papillary thyroid cancer, Bethesda 6. We say therapeutic thyroidectomy. What do we mean by a therapeutic thyroidectomy these days, Susan? Can I backtrack? Am I allowed to do that? Please, go ahead. Um, I just want to be a little provocative to say that there, there are some data that say that the larger your nodule is, the less likely it is to grow. So that larger nodules may be less likely to grow, and um, the literature you can—it's literature about large nodules and mismalignancies with FNA. Whatever you believe, you'll find a paper to support that. <laughs> so if you're a surgeon, you're going to find a surgical series that says we operate on a bunch of benign cytologies and look at all the cancers they missed. If you're an endocrinologist who does ultrasound and ultrasound FNA, you'll look at a really great study where the def definition of benignity is the cytology was benign and we followed the nodule and it remained benign. And you'll be totally satisfied that you can do a very adequate FNA in a large nodule. And if it's benign, it's going to be benign. So I just wanted to point that out and then to say that, again, I think when you are approaching a large nodule, there are a couple of caveats. And Dave said one that was very important. It has to look sonographically benign. And although we believe that nodules are one or another thing, you can sometimes have a cancer that grows in a large benign nodule, so that you do want to make sure that sonographically the nodule that you're biopsying that's four and a half centimeters is homogeneous in its sonographic appearance, and you don't have sort of an isoechoic nodule where there's a very hypoechoic area that's growing in it. Because the follicular cells in a large benign nodule are there a long time, and they can develop their own mutations. So with the caveats of a large benign nodule that is sonographically similar and a good technique, I do think it's, as the endocrinologist, I do think that it can be very appropriate um, to follow that nodule, and it probably is less likely to grow. But if you want to operate, there are a number of papers that will support you. A so on to the malignancy therapy. side of things. Yeah. What is a therapeutic so thyroidectomy? A therapeutic thyroidectomy. That's really interesting because it has the word, it has the adjective therapeutic. So what is therapy for thyroid cancer? And, and that's a moving target. I, my, my surgeon says to me all the time, and most of you are on Epic, I get these messages, okay, lobectomy was sufficient or do I have to do completion? This is really complicated, Susan. It used to be so easy. It was cancer. I did a lobe. I had to go back and do the other side for therapy. And so we literally will get Epic messages seeing patient post-op completion or not because what is the right therapy? So um, the therapy depends upon the cancer. And sometimes you don't know what the cancer is until after the surgery. And certainly, if we're here, we're talking about a cytology that is malignant. So we're not talking about a follicular neoplasm cytology that ends up being malignant, but you're talking about potentially papillary cancer. Because if this were medullary cancer, we all know that we would do more than a therapeutic thyroidectomy. We would probably include some lymph nodes. So given that the cytology is diagnostic of papillary carcinoma, what is therapy for papillary carcinoma? And I'll ask you oh, to I, ask I, else I can be provocative room. again. Yeah. So I think that um, for those of us who use molecular diagnostic tests that actually look at oncogenes, one of the um, benefits of doing that is that we can start to look at the genes and what the predictive value is that they have for aggressive invasive tumors versus more low risk tumors. So for instance, uh, you know, if you looked at a, a, a nodule that was malignant, and it came back with some sort of, sort of compound mutation like BRAF plus TERT or BRAF plus P53 versus a nodule that just has an isolated RAS mutation, I think you can make a very clear argument for being more aggressive with surgery or less aggressive with surg surgery. But, but let me step in and stop you there, because uh, we'll be talking about molecular markers in some more detail in just a well, then slide let's, or two. Let's get to it then. We're Ryan. getting right to it. But I want to challenge you a little bit, because <laughs> this is cytologically malignant. And even here in the US, where molecular markers have been commercialized right, for I, the last four or five years, we don't apply them to malignant cytology. 
We apply Pardon them me? to indeterminate cytology. So you're not going to know what the mutation profile of that malignancy is unless well, you're going to go beyond what we currently see as recommendations. That's right, and that's why I said I'm being provocative. So I think you can apply them to malignant cytology. It, it certainly is possible. Um, oftentimes you can get pre-authorization from an insurance company so that they will allow you to do that if you can make an adequate argument, and many of them will pay for it anyway. And I'm not recommending that this is done wholesale across the board. But if that information can help you determine the appropriate extent of surgery and spare someone a total thyroidectomy who doesn't need it, it's a reasonable application of this technology to the extent that it's possible. Eric, help me out here. I, I help you out. I, 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 we're starting to get into the complexity of molecular understandings of thyroid carcinoma, and it is, a, a, I believe, still in its infancy. And all of the points raise very provocative <coughs> questions. I do want to just comment on a few things, which is our understanding of the use of molecular tools for prognostic behavior is still, I think, very young, and I think we only have a very minority of, of cancers where we understand how that plays out. Steve's point, whereas if it could help you understand whether to do a hemi or a near total, is a very valid one. I would also caution you, however, that there are many molecular mutations that likely exist in benign nodules, that's starting to be said, and also oncogenes that we think are oncogenes likely require something else to make something as malignant as we think malignancy is. There's, there's many other permutations to this I think remain unanswered. Uh, Yuri. Yeah, just perhaps something to reconcile this two kind of point of view. I mean, obviously we need data, correct? That's 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 when really that's how we we we, man, we, 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 we sort of manage patients these days. And this data should be generated by clinical trials. Just you know, want to mention that, for example, at the University of Pittsburgh, about a half a year ago, we have started exactly this clinical trial prospective clinical trial of how molecular markers on malignant cytology can inform extent of surgery. We have to wait for another year or two. I know that I heard that now it becomes like multi-institutional trial. So when we get this data, probably will be equipped better with sort of making this decision and applying this to malignant cytology. Eric. And I just want to follow up too on the ATA guidelines. And I realize we've come 18 months, 24 months past that, and, and there are evolving data that are very important to take into account. But as it relates to histopathology, there's a clear recommendation that further molecular analysis, in particular looking for BRAF or otherwise, is not recommended in addition to what you get from the histopathology staging because it was felt that it was not complementary. It did not offer you more than what you already knew from the histopathology. So let me uh, push the discussion forward a little bit so that we can. Um, the indeterminate category, obviously, is the location where those molecular markers are currently being targeted, in the US at least. Um, and the idea is to try and avoid the so-called unneeded surgery for uh, what ultimately turns out to be benign but was cytologically indeterminate. And of course, in addition, suboptimal surgery potentially for the high-risk cancers that show up in the indeterminate category but turn out to be bad cancers and you need the completion thyroidectomy. There's an argument about how often that really happens, and I think we'll get engaged in that discussion in just a few minutes. But this is the area into which the molecular marker technology really sits. And even 18 months ago, two years ago, as the guidelines were being written, the ATA endorsed the concept of molecular testing in these indeterminate categories. In fact, the ATA guidelines support the option for molecular testing as a malignancy risk assessment as an adjunct to cytology in all three of these indeterminate categories. And what Steve was talking about a little earlier was really pushing the envelope beyond this adjunct to cytopathology, maybe into the domain where it replaces cytopathology. And we'll see how that pans out in the next few years. But there'll be some anxious moments for the cytopathologists in the audience, I'm sure. <laughs> so the idea here is that we should have an ability to rule out cancer and uh, through rule out testing of molecular studies and avoid a surgical intervention and improve the diagnostic uh, abilities of our biopsy. Or alternatively, do rule in testing where we identify a cancer and offer appropriate surgery in that setting. And I'm going to ask um, Eric, first of all, just to walk us through the uh, Affirma assay, uh, the gene expression classifier, just a few minutes on how it was developed and, and what its data show that support its use. Uh, sure. Uh, and so I'll speak almost on behalf of myself and Brian Haugen, if he's here, because the two of us really co-led this effort, and many others, including on this panel, Susan, Dave, and others, who are very much a part of all of the steering on this. So I'll, I'll speak on behalf of the team, really. 
Um, and I'll give credit first to say that I and none of the other authors had nothing, anything to do with discovering this test. This was an RNA-based expression test, and, the, and the, uh, the discovery really belongs on the scientific end to Julia Kennedy and her team at Verisite. The concept was, about a decade ago, that the ability to uh, understand the expression of all of the RNA and all of the genes in your body would become available on a single chip. And with that, would there be the ability then to improve this and use this as a diagnostic or prognostic tool? And so you really enter into this process unhypothesized, meaning you don't necessarily choose the gene that you think will cause cancer or, conversely, benign disease. You instead see what falls out when you look at the expression of all genes in a malignant population or a benign population. And so that went through a series of testing and iteration iterations and blinded kind of reanalyses to come up with a pattern, and initially the pattern was about 160 RNA expressed units, uh, and that came out with a signature. Um, and this was then developed into a receiver operating curve, and we could really choose anywhere on that curve to put the point, uh, but the need at the time was to uh, deal with unnecessary surgery to try and prevent that for the patient, and so we maximized negative predictive value or sensitivity in lieu then of worsening and losing positive predictive value. And so the final performance in your New England Journal paper was uh, in terms of neg that negative predictive value? So for all, all, indes all cytologically indeterminants, and this was really applied only to Bethesda 3 and 4, the AUS plus or the follicular neoplasm, for all of them it was approximately 95 percent was the negative predictive value uh, when the incidence of cancer in that population was roughly 24 percent or so. So, and I think that's a really important point that the 5% threshold is an arbitrary threshold for the residual risk of cancer, but I think it passes the gut check test that if you have a risk of cancer and you can honestly say to the patient, the chance that this is a cancer is less than 5%, most patients seem willing to accept that and not move ahead with surgery. And if you can couch it in the same terms as cytopathology being benign, I think that's a pretty reassuring message. What about the positive predictive value, the rule-in component of this assay? So it was not designed as a rule-in test. It was designed to allow that half of the indeterminate population that would be a firma benign to then know they had a true benign and essentially treat that nodule like a benign nodule. So 50 percent of that indeterminate population gets pulled out and can live a normal life watching a benign nodule. And I think those data have held up well. That, however, leaves you on the other side, which is that at roughly 50 percent will have an affirma that is suspicious and, of course, cytologically abnormal before that. Um, and at that point, we think the risk of malignancy roughly is 40 to 50 percent, and usually we, we lead towards surgery at that point. So the second uh, available test that was uh, in the market, in fact, um, maybe it was even a little before the Affirma assay came along that Dr. Nikiforov was developing the first version of ThyroSeq, as it's now called. Uh, the currently commercially available version is ThyroSeq version 2. And Yuri, in the interest of balance, I'll give you equal time to your opponent, and, <laughs> and perhaps you could tell and, a little bit. we are not opponents of yeah, friends. I was going to say, I don't think that we are opponents. I think that we really both work on the same sort of, you know, to achieve the same goal, which is to, 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 to really provide much more sort of nuanced and individualized management and pretty much prevent the unnecessary surgeries. So, I mean, we have followed a kind of little bit more traditional sort of approach, if you wish, and as molecular genetics has been generally developing and blooming in all fields of oncology, lung, colon, everywhere, of course, in thyroid, major discoveries have been made. And the kind of a dream to have a test that really will provide sort of, you know, give us a lot of answers actually came after BRAF was discovered. This was a critical point because after the discovery of BRAF, we realized that we know molecular profiles of more than like 70 percent of thyroid cancer. So at that time, we kind of sort of were able to, to build a relatively small seven gene panel. That was actually very, very first steps, baby steps of molecular testing. And now with the next generation sequencing, with, with much many more discoveries sort of that have been made in multiple labs around the world, we were able to come with this test which we call CyroSeq. It is based on a different analyte, it's based on the mutations or gene fusion on specific genetic events that occur in thyroid cancer. And next generation sequencing is a new technology that provides the ability to, to test for multiple genes in one, in one sort of uh, assay. And that's what sort of helped us to really put as many markers as possible and then sort of with, with extensive validation to, to provide uh, 
performance that we believe is, is clinically helpful. So is it true to say that the uh, Affirma assay is a rule-out test and Pharaseq version 2 is a rule-in test? Uh, obviously, so the, 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 the Affirma led the way in the field with really establishing kind of a, a standard for the negative predictive value. And we were happy to see that in our hands with really this extended panel, we were able to match the negative predictive value. So we do believe that our test based on the data that we have is also acceptable is a good rule, rule out test for thyroid. In terms of positive predictive value, it appears to perform on a, on a, on a, on a good level, and uh, although obviously there is a significant variability between different institutions based on the pathological assessment, now NIFTP and so on and so forth, but we do believe that data that we have suggest that it's very good rule out test and also a rule in test. So it's important to realize there are other players in the commercial marketplace, and again, these tests are available here in the United States primarily. I think some of them are available overseas, but the cost basis for them is a little different when we balance it against the cost of interventions overseas compared to the very expensive United States system where surgery is a super expensive tool. But nonetheless, these uh, various assays are available, and I've listed them here. There's a list of um, various uh, you know, uh, pros and cons of the different studies. But very clearly, this field is evolving really rapidly with new assays coming along, new versions of the assays coming along, even of those established assays. We're hearing now about a new version of Affirma, a new version of Thyroseq potentially. So this is a very rapidly evolving field. And I know that the commercial folks in the exhibit hall are going to be very enthusiastic to bend your ear around this thing. Um, the challenge, of course, is with the established players in the field, there's now a feeling that doing a clinical trial of these new, study, uh, new tests might be in some way challenging or even, I've heard it said, unethical. How can you possibly do a clinical study that requires you to take folks with a negative classifier to the operating room and make that an ethical study when we have tests that will prevent the need for that surgery? So for the other folks on this panel, uh, let's just take you one at a time and tell me what you think about that ability to run an ethical study. Let's start with Susan. So I think it is possible. Um, I think it um, is possible to potentially identify a population um, where you might not want to. And again, it would not be the way to potentially do that. Well, there are two ways to do this. So one is that you could do it historically. So with that patient, so you could take samples, which a number of these companies are doing, um, so that you're actually not dealing with patients, but that you're dealing with cytology that's already been obtained, that's in a certain category where you know patients have already had the surgery, and you're going back and you're doing you know, s sequential cytology slides from different centers, and you're looking at those and you're correlating it. So that doesn't involve patients, and that's one way to do it retrospectively, and to try to be as consecutive as possible so that you avoid selection bias. And then you would potentially be able to get all comers. Um, I think there is potentially another way to do it, but it's, it's not all comers. And, and I would say that it, at this time, um, and I think you both, Yuri and, and um, Eric, both alluded to this, is that what we're really, we're discussing a test where we are interested in see either positive or negative predictive value. And at this point, the test that has really been validated for its negative predictive value to date is the gene expression classifier. So I think your question, and you worded it the same way, was you said, how can you enroll someone in a study when you know there is a test with potentially a good negative predictive value? Um, that you could offer a patient rather than taking potentially one of the other three studies there that hasn't been validated in a prospective fashion. So I would sort of assume that you're saying when you could offer the GEC to a patient, which is negative, how could you enroll them in a prospective study that involves one of the other three um, panels of markers um, to evaluate its negative predictive value? And I think you can. I, and I think it's possible and I think it's potentially been done where you know, you could basically use what we talked about, which is a combination of the patient factors and the ultrasound factors, and look at your cytology and decide if it's a nodule that you feel, based upon your pretest um, estimation of the risk of malignancy based upon cytology and patient factors, that doesn't fall into what Eric nicely said was the 24% risk of malignancy. So, so in other words, you would take 
a patient that, that have a pretest probability, probability above that's higher. So it might be, I would say that, you know, with an AUS flesh cytology that has a different ultrasound appearance, it's hypoechoic. Um, Dave has shown this in his paper. It's been shown in a couple of abstracts as well. The pretest of malignancy in that nodule might be 35%, and I think I could prospectively enroll that patient in a study. Steve, your comments. So I think the study that really needs to be done is um, to take the tests, the, the two, three, four, or more tests that we're interested in investigating, and we need to sort of do all the tests on a population and offer surgical management if any of the tests is positive or suggestive of malignancy, and if all of them are negative, not operate on those people. And I think that really is going to be the only way that we're going to know how well the tests perform in terms of the truth, which is histology, and how well they perform in terms of each other. And unless somebody has a really, really big checkbook, that's never going to happen. <laughs> a huge challenge. David, a last comment on this? Um, I, I agree with Susan. I think that because the currently um, available tests um, are not perfect, uh, with informed consent and patient altruism, I think you can ethically uh, run a study looking at this. I like your idea, but I think it's completely <laughs> unreasonable in terms of um, well, no, provo likely provocative, provocative, provocative <laughs> idea. Um, so I think that we, we can continue to uh, study these. Um, it does beg the question, as fast as the field is moving, should we put the brakes on a little bit and try to develop the tests? to get, you know, because you can't have 100% sensitivity and specificity, it just, it doesn't exist. Um, but we, can we let the science advance and then assess the, you know, utility of the test? Because uh, one of the frustrations is to enroll patients in the prior generation. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think, I do think that, you know, this is a highly controversial area and we're going to be hearing a lot more of it during this Congress, I'm sure. Uh, there's several other sessions that we'll be drilling down into the details of that. Um, I do want to um, emphasize that in the U.S. at least, um, there is some evidence that molecular markers can be cost effective, at least in a statistical modeling exercise and a few small studies that have supported this. Again, it's based on uh, reimbursement and costs for the United States, which are quite different from most of the rest of the world. And how this will work out in other parts of the world, I think, remain to be seen. So I'm very excited to engage with such an international audience today to uh, see if we can kind of begin to drill down on how these things could be applied worldwide or whether there's just no sense in even discussing it. So I wanted to use the next uh, half hour or so just to try and apply some of this information to a few cases. And these are, for the most part, pretty simple, straightforward. It's just a thyroid nodule. Um, that's the kind of thing that uh, when I was at least a fellow, it was said, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world to deal with. So let's see if that's really true. This is a woman of 37, completely asymptomatic. She's actually uh, seeing, going for a well woman exam, and as part of that, uh, she has thyroid peroxidase antibodies and a TSH measured. And the TPO antibodies were 32, minimally elevated, and the TSH is normal at 2.1. There's a family history of hypothyroidism affecting a couple of female relatives, not her mom. Um, this is a case that presented in Florida, and perhaps we're a little out in the extreme again there in the wild, wild west of Florida. Um, but an ultrasound scan was performed as part of the screening for uh, this patient with positive antibodies. And there's a 0 0.9 centimeter nodule identified in the thyroid gland. Susan, what do you think about the nodule and what would we do? I was waiting for the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, this is 0 0.9 centimeter nodule. It's um, a hypoechoic nodule. It's not markedly hypoechoic. Um, I can't quite see because the arrow's there, but that would be, it looks like they're shadowing behind that calcification. Yep. So that would be a dense central calcification in a hypoechoic nodule. The borders, I, they, in this one image, um, Maybe there's a little lobulation. It's very hard to comment on. So the borders are either going to be smooth or they're going to have mild lobulation, which could potentially bring this into either from an intermediate to a high risk category. Um, just a very important point an isolated macro calcification in an otherwise solid hypoechoic nodule like this um, is not known to change malignancy risk. It's not the coarse calcification you can see in a medullary. So this would either be otherwise considered by grayscale a um, intermediate or potentially a high suspicion nodule if it had lobulated borders. Having said that, it is sub-centimeter. Um, I assume that there are no abnormal lymph nodes. 
Um, well, this was a thyroid ultrasound, so we didn't have so, that information at the time. So before we make a decision, even <laughs> before we make a decision about observation or not, part of any ultrasound is to evaluate the lateral and central compartments of the neck because that may absolutely change what you do. That would then confirm it to be high suspicion and even with a micropapillary carcinoma, a, um, a cancer that you'd want to address. So would you like to give us that or just? Um, so I will tell you that the ultrasound was subsequently done and was negative. Okay. This nodule, the, the lateral necks were negative. This nodule was uh, reported to be 0.9 centimeters with smooth borders, okay. uh, central calcification and hypoechoic mm -hmm. with internal vascular uh, flow of a grade two to three. Does the vascular not play a role anymore? So the vascularity um, does not play a role in areas that are iodine sufficient because that has not been shown to be helpful um, in, distinct, in large multivariable analysis in addition to grayscale features in trying to predict cancer. It may be more relevant in areas where follicular carcinomas are more prevalent, but not in the United States. So, so then the, we're stuck, we, we have yeah. an image here of a intermediate suspicion nodule, so it's not high suspicion, mm -hmm. um, with no abnormal lymph nodes, and I would say even if it's high suspicion, then you're potentially dealing with a micropapillary carcinoma that appears to be not near the, tra I assume this is a sagittal image? Yeah. So not near the trachea that has borders all around it, and is not considered sonographically a high-risk nodule. So are you going to biopsy it? I will not biopsy this. Anybody nodule. on the panel want to biopsy it? Maybe. So, and, and, the, and the maybe is because That's why I the, love this group. The, but the maybe is because the, the real question I think um, that I think arises from a nodule like this is that how many people are going to follow this nodule with annual neck ultrasonography every year for the next 10 years? And, and, and I'm sure that no one in this room would do it, but many people out in the general community would do that. And I mean, I think these people get, they get over doctored and over ultrasounded, you know, to, to the point of, um, of craziness. So, if a biopsy in this patient came back either cytologically benign or was indeterminate with negative molecular genetic testing, you pick the test that you like, and that gave you enough confidence to say, let's look at it again in a year, make sure that it's not growing. If it's not, then we'll take a pretty hands-off approach. There's an argument, I think, to be made for that as well. So um, the ultrasound was repeated, and, and the repeat measurements on the same nodule about a month after this ultrasound was done measured the longest dimension as 1.0 centimeters. Susan, is that going to change your view? Well, it's not sub-centimeter anymore, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you have to have a cutoff somewhere. And um, <laughs> um, the hypo, this hypochoic solid appearance is, um, has the highest sensitivity for papillary carcinoma, not for PTC follicular variants, or for follicular carcinomas. And, uh, you know, the one centimeter cutoff where in a metric system was fairly arbitrary, I could probably remeasure it and move the cursor and make it nine millimeters. So I think you're having your discussion with your patient. And what you would be expecting to see here is that this would either be benign, this would be unlikely to be follicular architecture, it would either be benign or you would start to see potentially some nuclear features. So um, the remeasurement at 1.0 was enough to trigger the biopsy because that's within the threshold and looking at the two images side by side there really was no difference, it just is a matter of cursor placement but uh, as you say you have to cut a, a threshold somewhere. So biopsy was performed, um, no complications other than a little bruising on the neck, um, and the report was atypia, somewhat hypocellular specimen, but atypia with no nuclear features of papillary thyroid cancer. It was classified as Bethesda 3. So the question for the audience, sorry, for the panel now is uh, to, to repeat the fine needle, to move with molecular markers. We've already got lateral neck imaging, so we take that out of the equation. Or are you just going to move to operate on this or instead observe it? So let's just run down the panel. Yuri, what would you like to do? Uh, my, being a pathologist, my slight concern is I don't necessarily like this nuclear. I, I mean, it's just few nuclei and I'm sitting, I don't see them very well, but they're kind of a little bit coarse chromatin, a little bit elongated. I mean, there was no discussion of medullary carcinoma in this case. No, and there was no family history, there was no nothing. Right. It's just an incidental thyroid nodule. Well, being me, being obviously biased, I would do molecular in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Eric? <laughs> You know, the, hard, the harder it gets is the more, the more you open up Pandora's box, and it's very important to note that, that the more this gets opened up in communication also with the patient, the harder it is for, if we have a hard time understanding it, you can only imagine the difficulty of trying to describe indeterminate risk of malignancy and what that means to a patient and for them to grasp a decision that they believe is informed.
So I was with Susan on not touching it before. As you start down this path, I will say it is very difficult to stop the train. Absolutely. Susan? I agree. Um, but your question is, you didn't say what you were doing I next. did. I was hoping you would yeah. just move on. Would you, would you so, do a repeat biopsy? It was a scanty specimen. So scanty, I would repeat the biopsy for cytology with a scanty specimen. And uh, what's your evidence basis for a repeat cytology rather than going with a molecular so marker? Given, so, so one of the things for the cytologists out there, just a, just a plea from, the, from probably all of us, you're going to tell us if a specimen is adequate or inadequate. And that's great. Let us know if it's adequate or inadequate. But then to put scanty or few after you've labeled a specimen as adequate, then just label it as inadequate. And I, I realize like maybe a cytologist can try to help us to understand that. You've said this is an adequate specimen, but then we get the word scanty, and we're sort of stuck. Are you trying to tell us that you really wanted more material there, but you made a diagnosis based on the material that you have? And, and what does that do for us? And usually it generates a phone call for me to you know, my cytology group. But um, I would say that even if this was an adequate, so, so I'm going to even make it simpler. So let's say this wasn't just scanty, but it was atypia. I would use the literature that has been shown from our institution, from some of the Boston institutions as well, that this particular cytology category, if you repeat the FNA, between approximately 40 to 45 percent of the time, and looking at both the specimens together, you will end up with a benign cytology. So I will excuse the scanty part and say repeat the FNA for that reason. Okay. So um, just to defend the cytopathologist, the reason for the distinction between an inadequate specimen and the report even with adequate of scanty is because of the technical definition of an inadequate specimen, which defines the number of cells and the number of, uh, of um, clusters of cells, groupings of cells. Yep. And they have very strict criteria for defining that. But if you happen to have plenty cells, but they're wrapped up mostly in blood clot, then you're going to have a specimen that is scanty for what you can see, even though it's technically adequate. And right? I understand, understand that. that. And I think it would be helpful in those situations, because our cytologists do a great job, and it's not that common that we see that, mm. to generate a phone call for the cytologist. Like, this is all about communication. We've all spent a lot of time talking about communicating with the patient, that if the cytopathologist does feel that's the reason, to actually express that to clinician, because that may inform the clinician about, wait, is this something, if I am going to do molecular testing, do I go straight to molecular testing, or is this something that does meet the adequacy criteria, but I want to repeat the FNA? Okay. Eric, just briefly. And, and I just, a very quick plug for the beauty of what you've created is, at the very beginning of this conference, if I could make a recommendation for at least how I will view my attendance at this conference, is that it has brought all of us together, and there are a few conferences that bring together such different people, surgeons, uh, cytologists, radiologists, endocrinologists, and name your specialty. Uh, and I think you gain the greatest growth by going to the area that is not necessarily your expertise, your comfort zone. And so I encourage all of us to do that. Yeah, we're so far out of my comfort zone right now, I can't even begin to describe it. <laughs> David, is this in your comfort zone? Uh, yeah, I think that this is something we see all the time, unfortunately. So assuming there's no radiation family history, it's something that clinically would push you to surgery. Um, I would say that I would uh, opt for a molecular test in this case. It's a very low risk uh, nodule. I preferred to have not stuck the needle in it, but once you have, I think that you would have been naive to assume that that biopsy was going to come back benign. So hopefully you would have anticipated the indeterminate or suspicious or malignant, and you would have talked to the patient about that's why we're doing the biopsy, so you would have saved some in RNAs or whatever you would do. I am not a believer in repeat FNA or let's shop that slide around to a bunch of pathologists <laughs> for the reason that Steve mentioned. I think they have a very difficult job. You know, I have tremendous uh, respect and appreciation for the people who are looking at slides and cells, um, but we have to just accept that there is an inherent um, randomness. Yeah, so if somebody else says it was benign or it gets benign on another FNA, that doesn't reassure me. I think we have the same. 20 to 30 percent risk of malignancy. So let's go to a different More assessment. Down. Steve. So if, I mean, if we're past the point now of deciding whether a biopsy or an aspiration should be done, I think it's very difficult to say what something is without an adequate sample of what that thing is. And if this is not an adequate sample, I think the intention should be to provide an adequate sample to a cytopathologist for an adequate evaluation. And if the specimen remains indeterminate, I would do molecular genetic testing on it, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, there was one other thing that we did do before she had a repeat biopsy or got molecular testing, and that was to check a serum calcitonin 
um, which was 49 with a normal range of less than 10. Um, Steve? <laughs> I'm even more impressed with Yuri now than I was yes. when I came in. <laughs> I didn't know it before. So I just yeah, that's, what, that's what they all say. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so this, so this is obviously very suspicious, would raise a suspicion for medullary thyroid cancer. I guess, you know, my, my next segue is, is that even if you didn't have the foresight to do this, um, there are a number of molecular genetic tests that do some sort of analysis for medullary thyroid cancer in the specimen as well. And this, if this is a medullary cancer, it would have uh, very likely been picked up on one of those molecular platforms. And certainly the established molecular tests uh, screen for medullary cancer for the most part, both uh, Affirma and Thyroseek both offer that opportunity, Derek. And, and that's not a calcitonin that's just 12 or 14 or just above your average range, just that's so we make clear of that. That's yeah. a calcitonin way outside what you'd expect from interference with Hashimoto's and would raise my high concern that that needs to be checked out or repeated or followed at a minimum after a biopsy. And, Susan? I, and I would, as a non-cytopathologist, but very, I have a lot of admiration for cytopathologists, I would actually point out that what Yuri said, including the dispersed cells, that if you potentially did repeat the FNA and got a more adequate specimen, it would be more likely that your cytopathologist would actually be able to call the medullary carcinoma because cytologically, although certainly there's literature about those that are missed, but an experienced cy cytopathologist will notice the nuclear changes and the dispersion of cells rather than the and yet another very strong reason for looking at the lateral neck and central compartment mm -hmm. for metastatic mm -hmm. lymph nodes, right? So it's worth noting that um, in many studies, medullary thyroid cancer shows up in the high Bethesda classes of five and six in the majority of cases, but actually shows up as Bethesda three in anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the cases that have been reported. So this is not an uncommon phenomenon yeah. for a Bethesda three to turn out to be a medullary cancer, albeit medullary is kind of rare. Um, the Europeans are a little ahead of us, or, or at least different from us uh, here in the U.S., because the European guidelines have traditionally said measure a calcitonin as part of the workup of every thyroid nodule, and that was rejected in the first couple of iterations of the ATA guidelines because of the cost-benefit ratio. Um, but what we've done is to start to adapt to the recognition that we're missing some medullaries in these groups and focus on measuring calcitonin when we have indeterminate cytopathology. We actually were also at this phase reflexing uh, molecular testing to Thyroseek version 2. And in fact, this uh, sample did get sent for Thyroseek and did show medullary thyroid cancer. So we had a double whammy here of information. And you, we can argue the cost consequences of doing both tests in due course. Um, so let's move on quickly if we can, because we just have about 15 or 16 minutes left. Uh, case number two. I have 10 more cases to go, so um, <laughs> case number two, a 52-year-old man, a 4.2 centimeter solitary thyroid nodule, lateral neck ultrasound was done and there's no suspicious nodes in the lateral neck and that's the nodule you see there. Um, Susan, is that one you're going to leave alone or is it one you're going to biopsy? No, we will biopsy this. Would you operate without a biopsy? Um, I would probably want to biopsy it. I would want to know what the other lobe looked like, though. The other lobe is completely clean. So um, the question I, is biopsy with a fine needle aspiration versus go straight to surgery because it's more than four centimeters. I would prefer to do the, uh, to do the biopsy. Um, Why? Four centimeters is around the cutoff between whether you'd start thinking about um, a total because now it might be a T3 if it were malignancy. I don't think it would be wrong to go do a lobectomy. Um, frozen, you could, you know, we could have a whole hour talking about whether or not it would be worthwhile doing the, uh, the frozen on it. Um, but again, back to the, you know, informed discussion with the patient. You know, if you know it's malignant, your discussion before surgery is, okay, we're talking about a malignancy, so how do you want to treat that malignancy yeah. versus, you know, it's probably benign just based on statistics. So. So Eric actually alluded to uh, the need to involve the patient in this discussion, and uh, this patient was absolutely clear he did not want surgery if it could be avoided. Um, so for that reason, I think uh, most of us would lean in the direction of doing the biopsy, which is what we did do, of course. And that biopsy was performed, and it was a follicular lesion with scanty colloid and high cellularity, and classified, therefore, as a Bethesda IV follicular neoplasm. So chance of malignancy in that nodule with this cytopathology, um, and then, uh, you know, what do we do about molecular markers in this setting? Steve, do you want to kick off? 
So, it, you know, so this again gets back to that point I made earlier, I, and there's a slide I have in a presentation that I'll show later uh, uh, tomorrow, but, um, you know, for a Bethesda Category 4 aspirate like this, the prevalence of malignancy can vary from 15% to about 35 to almost 40% in some institutions, and in some places I think even higher. And that is going to directly impact the predictive value that you rely on from any, neg uh, from any uh, molecular genetic test. You pick which one you want to use. So I think it's, first of all, very important that you know who your cytopathologist is and what the likelihood of cancer is given this diagnosis. The slide's a little hard for me to see. It doesn't look like, uh, it doesn't look from here at any rate like a Herthel cell neoplasm. I think right. this probably is a full Yeah, there was no evidence of Herthel cells reported. There was a little microfollicular architecture here and there and just lots of bland looking follicular yeah, cells. So I think that this is a case where I would be very comfortable sending molecular genetic testing and I would be able to appropriately counsel the patient on the risk of malignancy based on, on the result. Um, I think one of the nice things about looking at oncogenes in a spe specimen like this is that you, you don't get a simple binary result of either benign or suspicious. You're actually getting a report back on what the mutation is if there's a mutation present, which A, tells you what the mutation is and what the associated features of a cancer due to that mutation might be, but also that the, the lesion is clonally neoplastic. And if it's a clonal neoplasm, the question then becomes, even if it's benign now, what's the likelihood that over time it could develop invasive features? If this is an older patient, that may not be a relevant discussion, but if this is a 30-year-old person, it, it may be. So that's another uh, piece of information that I think would be helpful for molecular genetic testing. Susan, would you want to comment about repeat biopsy versus molecular versus just go straight to surgery with the follicular neoplasm? So, um, there's um, no data to support a repeat biopsy for cytology when it's at like this and it's a follicular neoplasm and I think it um, comes down to again knowing what the likelihood of this nodule um, being malignant is before you make any decisions and um, it's hard to tell from the nodule because it's one that looks a little mixed echogenicity it's more hypoechoic anteriorly and then a little bit less hypoechoic but overall it looks like a hypoechoic solid nodule without I didn't see any suspicious did they read it as a smooth margin Nodule. Yes, it was just a yeah, standard so, hypoechoic nodule. Um, and the literature with how son <laughs> sonography may modify risk for follicular neoplasm is probably not as good as it is for AUS plus. There's also a literature about whether it's larger in follicular neoplasm being more likely to be malignant, which hasn't always held up. So in our institution, it's 25 to 30 percent, and um, you have a discussion with the patient. So uh, the discussion was had by a different endocrinologist uh, who didn't use the same assay, but did send it for molecular markers. So this patient actually had two sets of molecular markers, said it was a firma suspicious, and thyroseek demonstrated a RAS mutant. Yeah. So uh, David, patient's now in your hands. What are you going to do with a suspicious, a firma, and a RAS mutant thyroseek? Um, and I would have probably um, let the patient decide, as, as Eric said, but I would have steered him towards surgery as soon as I got the mm -hmm. four centimeter follicular neoplasm on the cytology. Understood. But um, now you're in a slightly different situation. You've got more I don't think this helped me at all. I yeah. think I'm doing a lobectomy. I'm not doing a central node dissection. I, I tend to schedule patients for a hemi-possible total thyroidectomy because every once in a while you get in there and it's an invasive follicular carcinoma. Um, most of the time you can anticipate that based on the ultrasound or the clinical uh, impression, but I tend to schedule them that way. Probably the frozen wouldn't help. That might be, you know, a decision that you could talk to the patient about or, you know, uh, decide yourself. Um, so I think you just do a lobectomy. That's going to be curative, most you likely. Mean, would you agree with that? Yes, but I would say that, I mean, I would not say that molecular was not really helpful at all. At least you now don't even consider the option of observation for this patient. You, you and, I, and I understand. And if the, if the mutation testing had been negative, I would have been comfortable watching it. So it's, it's just that I would have guessed this is how it would have mm -hmm. gone. So it, it's a good point, though. Had the results both been benign, negative, I would have been comfortable watching it if that were the patient's preference. And uh, Eric, just with the affirma assay being suspicious this way, a lobectomy would be your recommendation, or would you do something different? That's a lot of testing that's already been done on a nodule for, for what I agree with Dave is likely already to need to be taken out. Um, I want to add one quick thing earlier on, and this is a plug to also go to, um, to acknowledge our pathology colleagues, which is, in, if you will, there is a new Bethesda coming out, and I encourage you to engage all of you in Bethesda 2.0 and have our cytologist explain what that is. Um, 
But when I think of Bethesda, an important piece in the indeterminate category is that there clearly is um, a, an awareness for all of us that we think risk of malignancy in the nodule. What's the proportion, the percentage that that nodule could prove uh, cancerous? There is also a very nice pro uh, progression of uh, what the malignancy is like to be a prognostic risk assessment. And that prognostic risk assessment moves from AUS to suspicious to positive, meaning you get more follicular variants of papillary up to classical and tall cell variants. But the one that stands out is, is Bethesda 4 here, follicular neoplasm, and it's where you do harbor some of your more dangerous malignancies. That's where the poorly differentiateds can come out and things like that. So I'm aware of them. Uh, it is still rare, and I don't like follicular neoplasms as much as I like the others. And I agree with Dave, once it hits this size, it's a young person, it's likely to grow with time. It does have some mutation. Opening up the RAS question is a big other discussion, uh, but I, I would lead to take it out. Yuri. So just maybe a few words. I mean, knowing, knowing that this tumor has RAS mutation, so what we should expect? And I don't know what is the outcome, but what we should expect? <laughs> We should expect that, th that this will, this is, we know that this is a neoplasm. We know this is not a hyperplastic nodule. This is one thing that we know. Then what neoplasm? Most statistically still of low risk neoplasm. 80 to 90% of them will be either NIFT-P or encapsulated follicular variant PTC or follicular adenoma. About 5 to 10% will be carcinoma. So if patients really would like to preserve thyroid, second lobe thyroid function, I would think that lobectomy based on this, based on this data would be. And okay. what we found was, in fact, a minimally invasive follicular thyroid carcinoma uh, now operated by a lobectomy. I think the question of uh, completion thyroidectomy can wait until some of our later sessions at the Congress rather than challenge you all with that right now. Um, but I think that was uh, uh, worth a consideration. Okay, case number three then, and we still have almost 10 minutes to go. So 46-year-old woman, a right neck nodule, turns out to be a 2.2 centimeter solitary thyroid nodule with no suspicious lateral lymph nodes. Um, there is nuclear pleomorphism moderate nuclear enlargement, a few microfollicles and clusters, a few nuclear grooves are also noted, but not enough to make it a Bethesda 5, it's a Bethesda 3 with nuclear atypia. Um, question for the, for the group, is there a role for nuclear atypia as part of the evaluation cytologically? It doesn't appear in the Bethesda 1.0, um, it's not clear in my understanding of Bethesda 2.0 whether nuclear atypia will play a role, but should it play a role? <coughs> What are the data? Susan, you can take this first. Um, so having heard um, Bill Fackwin talk a little bit about Bethesda II yesterday, my understanding is that nuclear atypia is going to play a role both in AUS VLES and in follicular neoplasm. Okay, good. Um, but I'm not, it's, I'm not involved in Bethesda II. I just heard the presentation yesterday as part of the advanced ultrasound course, so perhaps the cytopathologist can correct me if I'm wrong. But there are literature that even in the AUS FLESS group that whether you're talking about architectural atypia versus nuclear atypia, it means something different with the nuclear atypia having the progression that Eric discussed of AUS FLESS to suspicious to, to malignant. Um, and. Um, in the follicular neoplasm, that was a little bit newer to me um, yesterday, and I'm looking forward, as Eric said, to interacting with all of my cytopathology mm -hmm. colleagues here at this meeting to hear a little bit more about that. But when you're talking about nuclear atypia, then, you're going more towards the concept that this is some type of papillary carcinoma potentially more likely to be a follicular variant with this particular sonographic appearance and potentially with this particular cytologic diagnosis rather than the follicular neoplasm leading to the follicular adenoma, follicular carcinoma. Yuri? You're yeah, not I agree 100 percent with, with this. I mean, this nuclear tibia probably for some cytopathologists that would be, this, this uh, uh, sample would be interpreted as Bethesda 5 suspicious for malignancy. I see some little bit of nuclear clearing. clearing. So it's definitely not Bethesda 4 which is a much better defined microfollicular by architectural pattern. And I think one of the reasons to uh, emphasize this case is that this um, gradation between a Bethesda 5 suspicious for malignancy and a Bethesda 3 which is not enough to call it suspicious for malignancy, those two butt right up against one another. It's not you go from a 3 to a 4 to a 5, it's actually the 3 and the 5 that sometimes overlap significantly, at least in my experience. Um, and I think it's typically when you've got these nuclear atypias. And my suspicion is that explains a lot of that heterogeneity in different studies, particularly in the Bethesda 3 category, 
where some pathologists are putting things that another pathologist would call five into the three category and vice versa. I want also to stress that actually with such cytological presentation, we have to start thinking about NIFT-P because that's exactly moderately developed nuclear features of PTC which frequently have. Which yeah. is so we did do some molecular testing on this one as well, and once again, this patient had two sets of molecular tests. Somebody was paying large sums of money, obviously, um, but that's the uh, uh, findings. Once again, it's an firma suspicious and a RAS positive uh, uh, mutant. Um, how much surgery for this? What's the other lobe look like? Clean. And the nodes are negative. No lymph nodes. So lobectomy. Lobectomy alone. Everybody on the panel agree with lobe? No. Nobody wants to do a total? Mm -hmm. Really? The patient may want a total. But, but I do not. Yeah. I, I, oh, I would so. say the other thing to consider here, and we had a decision besides the lobe and the, um, the other lobe and the lymph node, is the euthyroid or hypothyroid state of the patient um, as well, just to include that. Yeah, so the patient is euthyroid at this point. And, so and, I, and I, I have to say that what worries me about taking the other side out as the surgeon is the nerve, not so much the pill that they would have to take if we did a total. Yeah. But the patients do care about that. Yeah. But. I do think it's important. Hypothyroidism is not treated surgically. So just because the patient's hypothyroid doesn't mean you have to do a mm -hmm. total. In fact, I would encourage you not to in this scenario. And, and where I was going with it though, Dave, was also that, that you do need to warn the patient there is a chance that the malignancy may be high risk Rest enough that you will need the contralateral sure. lobe removed right. for radioiodine purposes. And two surgeries compared to one is sometimes a, as a patient decision that they will mm -hmm. weigh in on. So, well, so, so let me just emphasize one thing about this case. Here we're talking about somebody who we're talking about possibly or likely has a papillary thyroid cancer. It's 2.2 centimeters in maximum dimension. And we have swung that pendulum so far away from where we were eight years ago when we had the first of these meetings, where a 2.2 centimeter papillary would be treated with a total thyroidectomy, mandated total, mm -hmm. central neck dissection, not just poking around in the central neck, and radioactive iodine treatment beyond that. And here we are eight years later saying, maybe a lobe is enough. It's a pretty remarkable change, Yuri. I want to stress just one thing. Molecular testing clearly answers the question, central node resection question mark. RAS positive tumors virtually never go to lymph nodes. This is actually one of pieces of information very, that can really inform you. BRAF very frequently, RAS virtually never. By virtue of having RAS mutations, I think any lymph node dissection, unless there is an overtly species ultrasound, should be out of the question. So since you're on the podium and since you were uh, one of the authors on the NIFT-P, um, would you like to just address briefly, you've got 30 seconds to tell us what NIFT-P <laughs> is. Okay, so we already saw today the diagram how thyroid cancer is growing rapidly, so it will stop growing and will go down in part due to this new entity, NIFT-P. So a group of, of multidisciplinary multi multi group, international group of uh, pathologists and, and clinicians sort of get together and reviewed a group of tumors that we knew and they're in the ATA classification as a very low risk encapsulated follicular variant of PTC and found that if the tumor is completely excised and there is no invasion, these patients have less than 1% risk of recurrence. So the group suggested to reclassify this, remove the word carcinoma and reclassify them as this non-invasive follicular steroid neoplasmus, popular like nuclear, sorry, long name, but NIFT-P is abbreviation. It is included in the WHO classification of thyroid cancer that just was released. So this is entity to stay and to consider in your clinical practice. And one important question, is this benign? It is not benign. It is an intermediate lesion. It's tumors that departed from the benign and have not reached full malignant potential. We, and this, this is a new concept for the thyroid field. In all other cancer types, colon, we know progression, breast, but in thyroid, we always were thinking about benign and malignant. And we have to accept that tumor doesn't become malignant overnight from the benign nodule. It's a spectrum, and this is an intermediate lesion, neither benign nor malignant. So I'd like to point out that we are 10 seconds early finishing this morning. I appreciate everybody's attention. I appreciate especially the panel's attention. Thank you very much. Indeed.